Well, welcome. Week three of Fake News. We are excited to be here together worshiping the Lord. What a great day. How many excited to be here to grow in God today, connect to God, worship the Lord? That's what it's all about. Well, we are excited. Uh, we actually are in week three of a series, Fake News, as we've been kind of diving into what God's Word says. How many of you know there's fake news everywhere? Everyone's a reporter. Everyone's got a camera. So we've been kind of walking through some things that we hear that we may even actually believe. We know people have said it, and quite honestly, they sounds like it should be true, but it's not in the Bible. The first week we talked about uh, how God just wants you happy. Uh, jump online, listen to that if you missed that week. Uh, last week we talked about sin, it's no big deal, and the fake news, the lies on those two things. Today we're going to jump into week three, and we're so excited. Each week I've been jumping online and just finding fake news for you, and I uh, found a couple that uh, I, I really like because, man, if this is true, this is really good. It's good for us. And so it's funny how people will just repost anything that sounds good, whether or not it's true. It's just if it looks like it came from an article, then it's true. So here's what I found out, that the United States actually found three states that we forgot about, and now we're up to 53 states in the United States. That's pretty exciting. The United States keeps growing. We're already the biggest country. We might as well make it three more. I also found out this this week, this morning. I didn't even have to look hard this morning and uh, found out that a real live leprechaun was spotted in Des Moines, Iowa. Iowa, pot of gold, rainbow to whole nine. I don't know about you, I'm thinking about actually moving, uh, packing my bags this afternoon. If there's gold there, I'm in. What am I thinking? If there's a leprechaun, I'm in. You realize how many likes I'd get on my Instagram post, right? That's amazing. So anywhere you look, there is fake news. Spiritually, it's the same thing. There are myths, thoughts, things that we hear about, believe, say, sometimes even live according to things that might feel good, but aren't the truth. And how many of you know we don't live things or believe things simply because they feel good? Isn't that right? Three of you thought so. I don't even know what you're doing. Half of you are like, uh, well, I don't know. Feeling good, that actually it means a lot to me. Like if it feels good. We don't live according to our feelings. We don't believe something just because it feels good and fits our lifestyle, right? There you are. I knew you were here. You even got to sleep until 11 today. Come on. The thing is, is 2 Timothy chapter 4 says this, and this is the series, the scripture we've been kind of dealing with, for the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own evil desires... They will gather around a great number of teachers who will say what their itching ears want to hear. In other words, the thoughts, the sayings, the beliefs, the doctrine, the theology that actually feels good and fits their life. They will turn their ears away from truth and turn them aside to myths or fake news. And so we've been kind of walking through the idea of God's word and how we stand on the foundation of God's word. It's all about his word. Everything else that we build our life upon, no matter how great it sounds or no matter how good it feels, is just shifting sand. But when we stand on God's word, we find a firm foundation of truth to build our life and our marriage and our finances and our decisions and our future upon God's word. So today I want to talk about a pretty deceptive belief and a thought that permeates our culture today. And it's the thought of it doesn't matter what you believe. And so many people wrongly subscribe to this thought. In other words, for whatever reason, they believe that all roads lead to God. That there's many ways to heaven. That if we just believe something about a God, doesn't even matter really what, and it's about a God that's bigger than us, then it's okay. That if we live good enough, that all religions are equal. And as long as we're sincere, God knows our heart. As long as if we're sincere, it's okay. It doesn't matter what we believe that all roads lead back to heaven. How many of you know it matters what you believe? Now, I know that may hurt someone who may believe something else. That may not even feel good for you to make that stance because we don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. But the truth is, what you believe determines how you live. And it's important to understand what you believe and even more importantly, why you believe what you believe. 
Because if you don't know why you believe what you believe, then eventually what you believe may shift. Our life follows what we believe. And what we believe should always determine how we live life. You know, in the Bible days, you may not know this, it's a pretty interesting fact, that in the Bible days, they didn't ask you, the church didn't ask you what you believe. Did you know that? They never asked you, Did, what do you believe in? They just assigned someone from the church to follow you around for three days. At the end of three days, they didn't ask you what you believe. They told you what you believe because your life says more about what you believe than your words. So our life matters, but what we believe matters. And in culture today, it's really easy to talk about basic spirituality, and there's really no controversy on it because basic spirituality says all roads lead to heaven and quite honestly it doesn't matter what you believe and as long as you believe in a religion or a thought or a God then it's okay and so we talk basic spirituality without any controversy you watch any sporting event and they can give thanks to God Grammys Oscars people can talk about religion and giving credit to a God talk shows will even talk about spirituality and a higher power but if you mention Jesus that's when it all shuts down and the fact is, you and I know this, it's all about Jesus. As a matter of fact, God's word says this in John 14, 6. Jesus answered him, said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, when you hear that and when you see that, you've got to recognize that it matters what you believe. And not all roads lead to the same. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. He doesn't mean his person as much as he means the resurrection, the cross, what he came to do, the assignment God sent him to earth to do, and the fact that he lived a spotless life and created a way, a bridge, a door for you and I to come through. There is no other way to heaven. There is no other way to eternity outside of hell than through Jesus Christ. Now... This truth sets Jesus apart from all other religions. It's not to be mean, and respectfully, I want to walk through some of those, and it sets Christianity apart in a massive way, and here's why. Because Jesus is the answer, not an answer. It's not okay to say, well, that's fine, I get it, you're a Christian. You, you even get paid to stand on a platform and talk about God. Of course you're going to say that. But I know this, I've got some really good friends who live really good lives they believe this and it's okay god and the fact is i know that it may sound harsh but the truth is jesus is the answer not an answer there is no other religion it doesn't matter if it's buddhism hinduism muslim uh new age scientology or if it's your way in other words you frankenstein who you think god should be and you frankenstein his teachings and and you just kind of patchwork anything that feels good to your life or there is no other thought no other religion all of those have have idols and non-personal gods who didn't really do anything but they come together and maybe it's based on your works or based on this or based on karma itself do good get good and so we kind of walk through life thinking okay well all roads lead it's fine it's all spiritual no it's not all spiritual there is one way to heaven and it's through the path of Jesus Christ Christianity his personal God, his love, shown through Jesus. He offers forgiveness of sins based not on our religious efforts, but based on his goodness alone. How many are thankful for the love of God, right? He didn't come to punish us. It is not his will that anyone should perish, but it is his will that every one of us would have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so when you hear, it doesn't matter what you believe, an objective look at God's word, an objective look at reality, you would have to say it's not right at all. And here's why. Jesus didn't come to start a denomination. He didn't come to start a church. He didn't come to build a building like this. He came for one reason, and that's a relationship with his creation. In other words, it's not about religion, it's about relationship. 
It's always been about relationship. It's not about what church or, or what denomination. It's not about what someone else says. It's about God's word, and it's about the fact that God loves you enough to send his son, Jesus Christ, on this earth to die for you and I to make a way where there was no way. See, religion says it's up to me. Relationship said it was up to God, but he already made the way. And because of the relationship and God's love, we now live according to his word. Now, it may be that you're here or you know someone who thinks, man, it doesn't matter what you believe. And so respectfully, I want to walk through this in a different way. So I'm going to ask you to sit up in your seats today, and we're going to walk through this with a little bit of an educational mind, okay? With a little bit of a scholastic view of what is happening and why we believe what we believe. And we're going to walk through this. So this is going to be like, you got to put your big boy pants on for today, right? And, and like, we're going to go deep. So take a deep breath. We're going to dive deep and stay under there a while. So if you don't get a good breath, you may die. Just flat pass out today, all right? So take a deep breath. We're going to kind of look at this objectively. We're going to look at it through the lens of, of, of an educator and through the lens of a scholastic view. You ready? Here we go. So this is important. And what we're doing today is a big deal because not only does it solidify the foundation of what we believe, that some of you need to recognize the word of God is true and active and living. It is not just a book. Some of you need to recognize why we stand on scripture. You don't know that. Some of you, your friends or your family, they say this and you don't even know how to defend your faith. So what I want to do is help you. I want to arm you. I want to put bullets in your spiritual gun today so that you can not only remind yourself why you live the way you live because your belief determines your life. Scripture is powerful. And I want to remind you why. But I also want to show us today on how to defend our faith. It's not mean to say Jesus is the way. It's just the fact. It's hard for us to amen that, isn't it? But we're in. Come on now. You ready? How many ready to go deep? Take a deep breath. Here we go. Lie number one I want to talk about today. It does matter what you believe. Lie number one, the Bible is just a book. Now, some people who may think it doesn't matter what you believe, maybe it's one of the religions we talked about a minute ago, maybe it's, it's for whatever reason and we just kind of Frankenstein our own God or, or we live our own way. And, and whatever, ever, for whatever reason, when I read that scripture, John 14, 6, and say, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, you're like, so what? I read a Harry Potter novel and it said a lot of things. That doesn't mean I live my life that way or wizardry, right? And so now we just kind of like, Go, well, it's just a book. Can I just lovingly tell you, the Bible is not just a book. It is the literal breath of God. <laughs> 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17 says, all scripture is God-breathed. Now stop right there. These two, we'll read the rest in just a minute. Just keep it up there. But God-breathed, this Greek word, is so important for us to recognize. The opniosis. The opniosis means this, in the Greek, divinely breathed, given by inspiration of God himself. So what the Bible is saying is all scripture comes from God. And it is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness, so that the man of God, that's you, that's me, be thoroughly equipped for every good work. You go, well, there you go again. You're using scripture to defend scripture when I already told you. I, what if I think it's just a book? Well, okay, let's talk about this lie of the Bible is just a book. First off, we know this. The Bible is the literal breath of God. 1400 to 1500 B.C., that's before Christ. 1400, 1500 B.C., God himself wrote the Ten Commandments on stone on Mount Sinai in ancient Hebrew. Now that is not debated, that is literal fact. There were too many eyewitnesses who saw it happen when Moses came down from Mount Sinai who stood there when the miracle took place. Not one person denies that God himself wrote the Ten Commandments. Think about this for just a moment. No one contradicts that. And yet the book, the Bible is built around this love story that God loved us so much. And the Ten Commandments were etched in stone. Later on, years later, five books of the Bible, called the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, right? Was written for thousands of years. Okay, 
I'm going somewhere. So I know that some of you are already going, oh, my head hurts. Okay, stay with me. Stay with me. Thousands of years, Scripture was recorded on animal skins. Okay, you go, why are you even telling me that? Well, they didn't have the cloud. Here's what I mean. Like right now, I can have Evernote on my computer, my phone, my iPad. I do one thing in one spot, shows up elsewhere. Okay? The Bible was written over thousands of years from many different men by God himself working through these men. And not once does scripture contradict itself. They didn't have an auto, oh, well, Luke said this. Well, you know what? That, that, I'm gonna, I like the way Luke said that. I'll change it a little bit to make people think that I wrote it. That didn't happen. You're talking about thousands of years scripture was written, 66 different books in the Bible. Watch this. 773,692 words written by men of different social, economic, Backgrounds, watch this, written by politicians, statesmen, farmers, shepherds, peasants, musicians, poets, tax collectors. You know that if those different styles of people wrote the Bible and never contradicted itself, that is a miracle. <laughs> written by, it's not like they were all in a room having a brainstorm meeting. Written by Moses in the wilderness, Jeremiah in a dungeon, Luke while he was traveling, Paul in prison, John while he was on exile on an island all by himself. No internet, no way to look up what's happening. Thirteen different countries the word of God was written from. Thirteen countries. Three continents, Asia, Africa, and Europe. In other words, this book, the Bible, is the most, the, the best-selling book ever written. It was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic over a span of 1,500 years and amazingly doesn't contradict itself one time. It is accurate. It is thorough. It is historically proven. It is the breath of God. Why do we stand on God's word? Why do we believe God's word? Why do we preach God's word? Why do we pray according to God's word? Why do we quote God's word? Because it's not just a book. The Bible says it is living, it is active. Its accuracy could never be done or duplicated. The Bible allows you and I a foundation to stand upon. It does matter what we believe. And we believe the word of God. Even when our life doesn't line up with it, we change our life. We don't change the word of God to fit us. The Bible deals with life, helps, grows you and me. The Bible talks about generosity, healing, hope, forgiveness, marriage, divorce, adultery, sex, lust, greed, guilt, materialism, parenting, prayer, friendship, holiness, pride, obedience. It deals with heaven, hell. It deals with lying, murder, suicide, rape, fears, doubt, miracles, love, hate, money, future, calling, criticism, creation, government, submission. The Bible deals with life. You think I'm done. Man, I'm just getting started. It deals with rebellion, peace, leadership, comparison, joy, discontentment, sacrifice, delayed gratification, patience, faithfulness, life itself, the breath that God created, self-control, the sacrifice of Jesus, disasters, injustices, demons, angels, discipleship, disciplines, spiritual disciplines, fasting, honor, mercy, loving the poor, caring for the poor, handling your wealth, dealing your money, allowing to honor God with your money, family, future, the spirit of God. We could talk all day. No other book, no other document from any other religion deals with life and props you and I up to be what God created us to be. The Bible is real. It was written. It never contradicts itself. I would say this, the Bible 
gives everything you need so you can fulfill everything God asks. Doesn't mean it's always easy, but it does mean it's always right. Now you may be there and go, okay, well still, I know that contradictory thing is a tough one. I don't know how to handle that. But let's talk a little bit further. You ready? In 1952, Steve Sanders was a historian, not a religious guy, a historian. And he used three specific tests to evaluate the authenticity of all historical writings. He zeroed the same three authenticity tests that he used on other historical writings that are accepted and taught in universities all around the world. He used it on the Bible. Here are the three tests. First was the internal test. That test simply asked this. Now I know you're going, well I don't even know what all this is. I didn't either, I just studied a lot this week. You ready? The internal test, do the writers of the Bible claim that their writings are true? In other words, what, whoever wrote it, whatever happened, did they say that this was fiction? Did they say they heard it from somebody? Or did they say they witnessed it? Did the people in the Bible, or, or the book, did people in the book contradict and say, no, 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 that didn't happen? Was there any pushback on what was said? The internal test, the characters and authors of the book. The New Testament was written in 47 to 95 A.D. after there were tons of first generation believers, hundreds, even thousands of first generation believers who saw the word of God in action and could have refuted scripture, but no one refutes the accounts of the word of God. Do you even understand the power in just that statement? That's better than you think it is. The internal tests, the characters, the authors, secondly, or let me just share this. That's why 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16, Peter is writing. And here's what he's saying. We do not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power of come, of, and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses. We, not I. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. In other words, there were a bunch of us. We saw it. We recorded it. No one refutes it. This was true. The external test. So we looked at the internal test. We look at the external test. In other words, this test right here uh, by Stephen Sanders, actually he used it for a lot of different historical writings. This test says, what does outside evidence, things not found on the paper, in the scrolls, the outside evidence say about the authenticity of said document? In this case, the Bible. Do they confirm biblical stories? Well, first off, we know this. There are tons of archaeological evidence uh, from statues to, to whatever you can find and put in a museum. There are museums in Washington, D.C., around the world, uh, in Israel, that actually support actual archaeological evidence that support the Word of God, outside evidence that show all of this stuff really happened. Not just that, but the actual places and the things that they can find on the walls and in the, in the ground that they've dug up prove that historical fact, the Bible was written and it was all true. Historical fact of Jesus Christ being real is well established. Listen to this. Now, we're not talking about the Bible. Put the Bible aside for just a second. There is non-biblical historical documents accepted by the world, writings about Jesus found in Roman culture, Greek culture, and Jewish culture. All three cultures, non-biblical writings about a man named Jesus Christ. A first century historian named Josephus. Josephus was not, uh, he didn't write a book in the Bible. He wasn't that, he was just a literal historian, first century, wrote about Jesus, John the Baptist, James, and many other other leaders in the book of Acts. In other words, the characters were real, the acts of the characters were real, and the fact that the Bible has so much archaeological evidence that provides external confirmations for literal hundreds and hundreds of biblical statements confirms scripture to be reality. It is a foundation for your life. Stop and recognize, we're not doing this just to go deep. I'm not trying to kill you today. What I'm trying to do is help you understand why we believe what we believe and the fact that it does matter what you believe. You need to be armed to share your faith and to know why you stand and know why you do your money the way you do your money and marriage, why you do your marriage and business, why you do your business. The Bible is the breath of God. It is not ink on a paper. Third test. So there was the internal test of the characters and authors say it's real anyone contradict it no external test there's evidence 
The next one is the bibliographic test. Now you go, I don't know what that is. This is simply this. How well were the original documents and manuscripts, scrolls, whatever it might be, how well were they taken? Did they find them? And how did they translate them? In other words, we want to know, did someone along the way mess it up? Well, after a manuscript was complete, if they found one mistake at all, they would throw it away. So first off, each manuscript scroll had to be complete, and they would destroy the whole copy if not. In around 70 AD, this is after death, the Romans attacked the Jewish people and tried to destroy their culture and their religious heritage. So the Jewish people actually took uh, the scrolls, the Bible, and took them on different manuscripts and scrolls and hid them in caves throughout the land. And uh, they sat there for over 1,800 years in bottles and in jars protected. Uh, they would use them, they would go back, hide them, and the historical writings were hidden. In 1947, Boudin shepherds actually found some jars and what they found were the Dead Sea Scrolls. You'll see a picture of it in just a moment. These are literally the things that were found in, the, in 1947. Archaeologists actually then found 11 other sources of ancient scrolls that support the 11 other sources. Not Bible, 11 other ones that support the Bible to be not just factual, but the breath of God. Now, you go, well, I'm sure that's not that many. So let's talk about it. You compare the Bible to some other historical documents, things that are taught in universities around the world, some people, some men, some historical figures, and let me show you what I'm talking about, that we believe are accurate and we stand upon. And it's this right here, like the Iliad of Homer, probably the most accepted non-biblical historical writing uh, that, that there is. Iliad of Homer, manuscripts and scrolls, original copies, that make it so that we know that this was factual history. We have 1,700 copies of the Iliad, which is unheard of. It's a ton. It is unbelievable amount of evidence proving the original manuscripts and documents, proving the Iliad to be true. Plato's Republic, another one that we accept, there are seven. Seven manuscripts and scrolls. Aristotle, five. Caesar, 10. Now, all of these we accept and teach in universities, in cultures, in nations all around the world. Not the Bible, but just the New Testament. You and I both know there's a whole nother part to the Bible. Just the New Testament alone, the scrolls and manuscripts that they have that prove that to be factual and true is 20, over 24,500 copies of original manuscripts and documents that no one refutes is real. Think about that for just a moment. The Bible stands alone. Now, I know we've been going deep, so let me just help you out a little bit. How many of you like to go to movies? Anybody like movies? There are two different kind of people in this room when you go see a movie. When you go see a movie, there are two people. One person just wants to sit there and enjoy it. The other person wants to try to predict everything in the movie and talks the entire time. If you're sitting next to someone, go ahead and point at them right now. That's you, right? Just to let you know, I'm the dude that tries to predict everything, right? There are people that sit there and be like, oh, okay, she did it. Oh, that's easy. He's going to find a treasure under his couch, right? Yeah, like that. I, I get it. Uh, like me, all the time. I'm just sitting there. Like I'm like three minutes in a movie, and I'm like, babe, I'm going to text you the end of this because I want you to know I knew it, right? And I'm like... I'm like, I already know, they think that's their dog. That's not their dog, that's their grandpa. Like, right? <laughs> He's alive, you know? And uh, so there's predictions. Let's talk about the side of the Bible that predicts, okay? We call them prophecies. And we call them things in the Old Testament that were written that had to be also written or received or fleshed out in the New Testament. Now, these predictions... A man, uh, now these prophecies, they were hundreds and hundreds of years later. So in some cases, thousands of years separated when the prophecies were written, everybody understand that in the Old Testament, and when they actually came true in the New Testament. Hundreds and hundreds of years. So it's easy if you see someone walking up to your front door to look, turn to your wife and go, hey, I bet you anything, uh, John's going to ring the doorbell in just a minute. Watch. That's not a prophecy. That's you saw him through the window. Now that, so... You know, right? So in this case, we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of years, sometimes even thousands of years that separated when, when something was written and when they came true. You're, you're going to be blown away by this. There was a man named Peter Stoner. Unfortunate last name, I get it. Peter Stoner. 
taught 12 classes, over 600 students in those 12 classes, and he wanted to talk about exactly this. How likely is it that the prophecies and the things written in the Old Testament came true in the New Testament? So the odds of the prophecies being fulfilled, so they took eight of the hundred, uh, there were thousands of prophecies and, and predictions and different things like that, but there were over 350 prophecies about Jesus Christ alone, and every single one of them came true. Do you even hear the words that are coming out of my mouth? 350 came true. They only took eight of them. What is the likelihood that eight prophecies in the Old Testament would actually come true in the New Testament? Governmental Statistic Board verified their findings, and the odds were one in quintillion that eight prophecies would be fulfilled. And there were thousands of things written in the Old Testament. Every single one of them came true. In other words, the Bible is not just ink on a piece of paper. It is the breath of the living God. And you and I can stand on it. We can live according to it. It's what we use to defend our faith. It's not just words when you utter them. They actually are living and active and powerful. Now some of you go, I don't know what a quintillion is. There it is. A one with 18 zeros. 18 zeros? Just to put it in perspective. Just eight prophecies. And they were... 350 about Jesus, thousands of things that had to come true. Not one of them missed. A thousand million is a billion. So far we're there. A thousand billions is a trillion. Some of us were gone already. A thousand trillions is a quadrillion. We're still not there. A thousand quadrillions is a quintillion. The odds that only eight of the thousands of things would line up in God's word to be right hundreds of years, in some cases thousands of years later in the New Testament, one in one with 18 zeros. Just eight of them. And we're talking, you can't even calculate. It, to put it in perspective, it'd be like this. You grab a quarter, grab a red magic marker, put a big X on a quarter. Drive anywhere you want in the state of Texas. I'm talking border, coast, Oklahoma, Panhandle, left, right, doesn't matter where, anywhere in the middle, go anywhere you want and drop a quarter. Then fill the entire state of Texas with two feet, two feet of quarters. All over the state, you pick one person, and one person has one chance to walk anywhere in the state of Texas, bend down, they got one grab, and the odds of them grabbing that one quarter with an X on it, is the same as just eight prophecies coming true in the New Testament. How many of you understand that the Bible is living, it is active, it is not just a book, we stand upon it, and when the Bible says, this is the only way, this is the only way. It does matter what you believe. It's the reason we preach it. So lie number one, we took most of our time talking about the Bible and here's why. Because otherwise, anyone can just simply say, well, yeah, right? It's just a book. Yeah, anyone can do that. No, 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 it's not a book. It is the breath of God. It is life for you and I. It is power in our prayers. When we quote scripture, when the enemy attacks your spirit and attacks your mind and attacks you and what you live and the way you live and how you believe, you can quote scripture back at him and he is defeated instantly because scripture is powerful. It is living. It is active. And listen, it may feel black and white to you, but when you align your life to the word of God, your life changes. So lie number one, the biggest one we'll talk about is the Bible is just a book. Lie number two is Jesus was just a man. I know it's tricky because he did become flesh, but he was not just a man. He was fully man, but he was fully God. He was fully God walking on this earth. Think about Jesus. He came for people like you, and he came for people like me. Mark chapter 2, verse 16 says, When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw Jesus eating with the sinners and tax collectors. Now stop there. No religious person would ever eat with sinners, tax collectors. They were too dirty, filthy, and sinful. But they saw Jesus doing it, and they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, 
but it's the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but I have come for sinners. It's the reason I'm here, to help people. All other gods, it's you better help me. You better do this right. With Jesus, it's all about I have come that people might find freedom and wholeness. Jesus was fully man, yeah, but he was fully God. He was not just a man. Jesus opened the blind eyes. He healed the lepers. He healed deaf ears. He made the mute to speak. He took five thousand, uh, uh, two loaves and five fish and he fed the 5,000 and all the women and children on top of it. He, he caught a woman in adultery and they were about to stone her. He drew a line in the sand and he said, no, 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 no. He who has no sin cast the first stone. He then turned to her and said, your sins are forgiven. Go and sin no more. He had the power to not only free, but to change a life. He walked on water. He raised the dead. He was not just a man. He was fully God. He was the picture of the love of God. Get this in your head. Jesus, why do we read you? Why do we worship you? Why do we preach you? Because it's the picture of God's love for you and I. He sent Jesus to die for you and I to make a way where there was no way. He became the bridge. He became the door. He became the only way. If I could say it how we would say it in 2018, I'd say Jesus is God's selfie. God snapped the picture, made it flesh, and sent it to earth. In fact, when you're truly honest, some of us in this room, we recognize that we're a product of the miracle of Jesus. And who Jesus was and what he did, what he came to do. Some of you have been healed. Doctors were shocked. Some of you were set free. Friends can't believe it. You had addictions, had a hold of you. Some of you, your marriage has been restored. You are not just a better version of who you were. You're a new you. And I'm a new me. I'm a different person. The old is gone. The new has come. You're a different person. The old is gone. The new has come. Why? Because Jesus was not just a man. He was fully God. And that changes everything. Lie one, the Bible is just a book. Lie two, Jesus was just a man. Lie three, the resurrection was a myth. I want to tell you why this gets attacked, especially by the enemy. Because these three lies, when you understand the truth behind all three of them, it changes what you believe and you recognize it does matter what I believe. You may not always like it. I may not always like it. But it's God's word, it's truth, and we stand on it because it's freedom and it's life. The resurrection was a myth, is a lie. Jesus was a real man, no one refutes it. You know what's funny is when Jesus came and he did all those miracles we just talked about, not once does someone in the Bible question the validity of the miracles. Think about that. No one says he didn't do it. You know what they say? Stop doing it on Sunday. Stop making us look bad because the way we're living doesn't change people's lives like the way you're living. Stop making people walk. Stop healing deaf ears. They never said Jesus didn't heal anybody. They just said stop doing it and making us look bad. Jesus came without sin. He could go to the cross and he became sin for us. And I don't want you to miss this. On the cross, creation mocked him. They beat him until he was unrecognizable as a human. They drove stakes into his wrists and to his heels. Jesus then looks up to God and he says, Father, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. Forgive them. Then he took a breath and he said this, it is finished. It's done. I just made a way. I know before now there was no way, but now there is a way. And into your hands I commit myself, my spirit. Now I want you to notice something, because this will change your life. Jesus didn't say, I am finished. He said, it is finished. He wasn't done. But the job he came to do was done. He made a way where there was no way. He wasn't finished. 
it was finished. We needed the cross. We needed the resurrection. We needed Jesus. We didn't just need a way. We needed the way. Jesus breathed his last breath. Everyone thought it's over. It's done for. They threw his body in a tomb and said he's dead. The earth went dark. The earth, scripture says, his history says, the earth trembled. The centurion who actually carried the cross for Jesus was not a believer. He turned and said, surely that man was the son of God. You know what he said? He wasn't even a religious person. Jesus was not just a man. We just made a mistake. Three days later, the stone was rolled away. The tomb was empty. Jesus was not there. He was raised from the dead. Peter spoke. Now, we already talked about the validity of God's word. Peter spoke in Acts 3.15. You killed the author of life. But God raised him from the dead. Watch these last words. We, we, not I. A bunch of us, hundreds of people that didn't even follow Jesus. We are witnesses of this fact. It is real. The resurrection was not a myth. This is so important because scripture says, remember, it's why we're talking about this today. To build your faith, to set your foundation, to help you understand how to combat the thought. It doesn't matter what you believe. But scripture says the same power that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. That same spirit of overcoming and victorious dwells in you. See, this separates Christianity from every other religion. Jesus isn't a statue. He's not dead. But God is alive. It's not a religious thought. It's life-changing fact. So, what about this resurrection other than the word of God? Three days later, Jesus rose from the dead. Matthew 28 recorded records it Luke 24 Mark 16 if it shows up once it's good enough we already talked about the validity of the Bible three times scripture says he's not here he is risen listen to this some of you may not know this 24 authors some biblical some not 24 authors saw Jesus and wrote about it in history the fact that he rose again 24 authors over 500 eyewitnesses random people saw Jesus walking around guys that's a lot of eyewitnesses that's a lot of authors who wrote about it no one wrote he was still in the tomb it's a joke see the resurrection reminds us failures are not fatal and death is not final why is the resurrection a big deal because what we believe reminds us that faith that failures are not fatal in other words, you may be here and you may have sin in your life, junk in your life. When you look backwards, you see more reasons why God shouldn't love you. But I'm here to tell you the resurrection shows you that God loves you. That his love goes beyond anything you could have done. The failures that you live with are not fatal. And death is not final. If you don't feel alive, it may not be physical death, but that's not the end either. There is eternity at stake. And resurrection reminds you and I of the truth and the power of God's word. Why are we talking about this? Because you got to recognize it does matter what you believe. We stand on the word of God. The word of God is living. It's active. It is more than a book. It is the literal breath of God. It is life. It is, it is breath to you and I. The word of God needs to be in us. We need to quote it. We need to know it. We need to read it. We need to say it. We need to live by the word of God. Jesus was not just a man Jesus was the son of God he was fully man yeah but he was fully God he's the author of life the resurrection changes everything for your life your marriage your business your money your future your calling your eternity the resurrection changed the game John 14 6 I'll read it again now it means something a little different John 14 6 the breath of God said to you and I, Jesus answered him, I am the way, I am the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is the only road that was built, the only bridge that was built. This is the only way you can enter eternity in heaven with God is through what Jesus Christ did on the cross and through the resurrection of him. Living your life on top of the foundation of God's word. It matters. There's power. 
in the word of God and there is power in the name of Jesus.